I left school at 15, but um, my father was a butcher in Smithfield Meat Market, very close to Fleet Street. And uh, one day the editor's secretary came in uh, to buy some meat and he said, any chance of a job for my son? And she said yes, and within three months I was working as a boy, as an assistant at Picture Post. And uh, I then got to know a very famous photographer, Bert Hardy, who took me under his wing and from that moment I just fell in love with photography. In 1960 I spent one year on the Daily Mail as a feature photographer and Bing Crosby was going to play at the London Palladium and the idea was that in the afternoon he would go out and play some golf. Half a dozen photographers from Fleet Street turned up in our suits and tyres as we wore them then and Bing came down with his golf clubs and he looked up at the sky and he said fellas I ain't going to play today it's going to rain and it started to spit with rain so we took a boring picture of him standing there with a golf club on his shoulder it was awful and I wasn't happy with that I went into the side entrance of Claridge's and I got in the lift with Bing Crosby and I said to him I said Mr Crosby if on a rainy day you don't play golf do you have a practice in your suite and he said sure I do and I said can I take a picture of you putting when we got out of the lift, he said, look, we won't do it in the suite, we'll do it outside on by the lift. So that particular picture is taken on the fifth floor, and the ash can is where the people used to put their cigarette ends in before getting into the lift. I brought that out, and he didn't get a, he didn't get a putter, he got a pitching wedge, and he stood there and pitched the ball, and it went into the bin. And they used it on page five, right across the page. And the following day, there was an argument that went on between Bing Crosby and the management and Bing Crosby left Claridge's and he never stayed there again. 1963 I was invited by Sir Harold Macmillan to go to his home and photograph him there which I thought was amazing. He was the Prime Minister of England and we went to the house Birch Grove in Sussex and uh, he gave me a drink of sherry and he invited me to walk around the house so he could show me the house. And we went into his bedroom, and there was his single bed, his slippers, his Lucasaid, the hotline telephone from Kennedy, who was Prime Minister, President of the United States. And I just, I said to him, I said, would you mind if I take a photograph? And he said, not at all. And I knew I was on a winner. February 1964, I was in Paris photographing two French rock stars. Johnny Halliday and Sylvie Vartin. And while I was there, I got a phone call from a friend of mine, an editor, and they just heard the Beatles were going on their first American tour. And if I could get a picture of them with an American flavour in it, I would be on a winner. And I went to uh, the George Sank Hotel where the Beatles were staying and spoke to Brian Epstein. I said, Brian, I've got this great idea. I know you're going to America. And I told him, and he liked it. So I went to the American embassy and I borrowed from the press attaché I borrowed their Stars and Stripes on the top of the building. It was enormous, I mean seriously enormous. And it took three guys to put it into a cab, bring it back to the hotel, erect it on the wall, and I photographed the Beatles on the wall against the uh, Stars and Stripes. 1964. Dear friend of mine, Les Perrin, he just signed up to do the uh, handle of Rolling Stones, and he rang me from his office in Tim Pan Alley, and he said, would I like to photograph the Stones? So I went up to Denmark Street and it was a dark February afternoon. I put them in a taxi. We went to my school in Clerkenwell and uh, I took that picture and it just reminds me when I look at it, it reminds me of standing there waiting for my mum to put me up from school. There was a certain period in 1972 when I took this photograph of magazines that when they got personalities for some reason, they got the fashion editor to go out and get clothes for them. So the session was uh, was arranged for a studio, and uh, I was there and Pete and Dud were there. But the clothes hadn't arrived. So I went into the dressing room to tell them that they hadn't arrived, and they was, one was standing with his shirt off and one was standing with his trousers off. And they said, Dave, where do, where do you want us? And I said, well, unfortunately, uh, the, the clothes are not ready. But I said, I'd like to do a shot of you as you are. Mad Oliver Reed, boy. I photographed uh, Oliver many, many times, different locations, and uh, 
There was one occasion when he had this old house, when I say old, about 17th century house, which he was having refurbished in, in Surrey, near Dorking. I went down there and he had a bar with the builders, the plumber, the bricklayer, the painter, whoever, were all sitting around the wall absolutely drunk. I mean, this is 11 o'clock in the morning, they all got pints of beer. And Oliver was dressed in, he was wearing a kilt with a pair of boots. He had a boy a cub's cap on, green with a yellow braid. He had a full navel, what I call a navel beard, but half of it had been shaved off. So, I mean, he looked absolutely crazy, he was crazy. And forgive me, but he, was, he had a bucket behind the the bar where he kept peeing into it. I was a bit disgusting, right? But on top of the bar there was this like hammock and with the bones hanging in the hammock. And he told me and he swore to me that they were his grandmother's bones. He'd gone down with one of his cronies to wherever and dug up the, the coffin and took the bones back. And and I I, I believe him. Nineteen seventy nine I was given an assignment to go down to Rio to photograph a very famous plastic surgeon. One lunchtime, I was sitting at a bar having a beer and I turned around and I'm sitting next to Ronnie Biggs, who came from the same similar part of London to me, so he was very interested in what was going on back home in London. And we got on very well, and after a few beers, I said, Ronnie, I'd love to do it while I'm down here, do some pictures of you. He said, well, what have you got in mind? I said, well, what about on a railway line? And he said... Brazil, we could get arrested, they have military installations, we could be in prison. I thought, I don't want to go to prison with Ronnie Biggs, that's the last thing I want to do. So anyway, we agreed, we'd do a picture, and uh, I said, it's very important what you're wearing, it's got to look macho, it's got to look strong. So the following day, we drove 10 miles out of Rio, and there was this isolated railway track, sat him on the railway track, did the pictures, and that was it. And it, I just have to mention to him that the following day, the 16th of February, was my birthday. So he said, right, we've got to celebrate. So he said, we'll pick you up 11 o'clock tomorrow morning and we'll go out and have a good lunch, so we, which we did. Anyway, 11 o'clock at night, this lunch went on for 12 hours, one of those lunches. 12 o'clock at night, he dropped me back at the hotel and I'm getting ready to bed and suddenly there's a knock at the door. So I open the door and there's this beautiful Brazilian girl standing there. And she said, I am your birthday present from Ronnie. Anyway, the uh, security people took her away and that was it. I ain't telling you what time they took her away. <laughs> I always felt, by photographing these so-called VIPs, that uh, to spend time with them, whether it's an hour or a day, or maybe certain people, two or three days, uh, sort of living with them virtually, that there were certain things that rubbed off, and I felt my education through life was always coming through from them. I'm a great one of, of listening to people and, and pinching their ideas, really. You know, I think if they've got great ideas, why not borrow them, you know?